was the house we were in before, and we had a, an integral garage there, and it was cool in there. I had my music on. She managed to shout me. She came in, we were talking. <sighs> she would go a bit vacant, drop out of the conversation, stop the conversation. I went in. She started to shake. And all of a sudden, her eyes rolled into the back of her head. She'd gone from the world. She went down to the floor. Still semi-conscious. And she was on the floor. She, Not fully aware of what was going on. The world. Conscious. Four minutes. Time every ten minutes. Uh, ticking in between. Ten to twenty seconds. Twenty minutes later. Four or five minutes. Or more minutes. Uh, she's just quite uh, shortly. Yeah. Uh, uh, again, then, uh, she'll just be on to... Uh, um, we talking. When I'm resting, I could be sitting down. I'd have my, my head would start to violently, um, violently shake backwards and forwards. And my hands would involuntarily just start moving. And I'm trying to get to sleep. It, it, it's, it's, I'm taking a huge amount of medication that would normally make you drowsy and normally get you to sleep and I'm still not sleeping and it's again when you're laying down and your head is going like this and you're wanting to sleep and you it's just so strange and um, a worrying um, process that you go through. Um, I was scared to sleep. Um, and to see my, my hands violently moving like this, um, and it, it was, yeah, it was, it got to the point where there's times I, sleep on my front with my arms underneath my body just so I can not have that wouldn't happen but then my head will be knocking like this I can normally tell because he sort of like zones out and his eyes become quite sort of staring <sighs> Some more water, is there something? No. Oh, you're okay. What's the word I'm thinking of? It, it was a, a huge differential from not having it to having it. Mine started within uh, 20 minutes. I suddenly had tremors and uh, Um, three days later, I had a full seizure. These, these experiences, um, without explanation, it's, it's hard to, to understand what, 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 what is going on. I had my first one when I was 17 in a music technology class and I just started to feel, it's sort of the typical symptoms of what I feel now, but obviously at the time I'd never felt them before. Um, and just fell off my chair. I was having um, two or three weeks sometimes and because they didn't know what it was, they were just every time, and, and because I was a school to cover their own backs, like I had an ambulance every time one happened. So I was constantly, been taken to hospital. Um, <clears throat> so I missed quite a lot of my A-level year. And then once I got to university, they kind of carried on. So um, when I, I, I did, at university, I did um, vocal and opera studies. So mid-opera, I had one and I had to have an ambulance in the middle of an opera one day. And once I got into my job that I do now, didn't have any for about a year. And I honestly thought they'd gone. Um, so when they did come back and happened again, it was, 
almost um it was it was devastating really because i just thought oh my word like i thought i thought that these had i thought that chapter had finished clearly it hasn't you know i don't want to make it like a big thing like i just had a funny do and i'm okay because of course everyone naturally is just like oh my god are you all right and i'm like yeah <laughs> I'm fine. <clears throat> Even if I wasn't. It's not a thought. It's not, oh, I am worried that I think there's one of those coming. It's it's physical. Like there's a balloon blowing up in my head. You know when you've had a few drinks and you're on like drink number two or three and you're aware where you are and you're aware who you is and you're aware what they're saying, you don't feel like you're there. You just kind of like, do you know what I mean? You start to lose a little bit of, um, what I'm looking for, like, what's the word? That is the closest I felt when I'm not having one to having one. But, because uh, when I said this to people before, they're like, oh, but that's lovely. <laughs> But, but it's not nice, like, you feel like you're there, but you're not there. I mean, one night I'd walk up in the middle of the night, open the door, gone out, walk about on my own. I didn't know what was happening. Came back full of cuts and bruises, scratches. I just opened the door, went out, fallen into bushes. Um, and the, and the, the police found you wandering. Me, wandering. When she fell, she had a tendency to fall on the right hand side, so on the left hand side rather. So that's why that injury there is, is uh, so taped up. But you can still see the scars on her face, where that's a permanent injury, uh, or a permanent result of all the falls that she's had and falling on that particular one spot all the time. This is some of the blood Just, where I've fallen. You know, sometimes if I was out or if I wasn't in the same room and she'd have a seizure, I'd go in and find her with a face like that, but also pools of blood like that lying on the floor, which is obviously a big shock. I think it's been harder for him than for me, because he's had to deal with it, he's had to see it and deal with me. I don't know what's going on half the time. I just come around either bleeding or unwell. So really, I feel more sorry for the person that's dealing it. The carer, it's harder for them. So I saw her with her eyes shut, frothing at the mouth and arms and legs shaking, and she was on the floor. And your automatic reaction is it's an epileptic attack. Now, as a layman, I thought they last two or three minutes, but she may need some treatment, so I called for the ambulance. Um, it went on for 5, 10, 15 minutes, the ambulance came, they took her to hospital and she was the same in hospital as well. And I'm thinking this is more serious than a normal epileptic fit, but nobody was talking to me. Uh, and I, obviously I was quite worried about it because what, what's happening? And then she got admitted and she was in for what, 10 weeks? And I'm thinking, that's not right. <laughs> First thing I was thinking was when I was a teenager, um, I had a lot of tests with my heart because I would just randomly fall unconscious. It was only like every couple of years, but I'd just go. I thought the best thing to do is just see what they say. All of them were like, everything you're saying seems to be epileptic but we can't find an epileptic waveform going through your brain. They, they just couldn't find it. it. Well, it didn't exist. No one could understand what was going on. All I wanted was someone to turn around and say, OK, I've seen it so many times before. This is what it is. It's the exact thing you need. You'll be on it for a year, and then you should be fine. I didn't want, oh, you're, you're still quite young, you're growing, or has there been some stresses in your life you don't know about? And then my parents are sat next to me in appointments going, oh, the, there was that time you got your bag stolen. And I'm thinking, it's not that. <laughs> Thank you. 
I was in Piccadilly train station in Manchester and I started to feel odd. So I get like an aura. I collapsed on the platform. I'm still aware of my surroundings. I can still hear everybody around me. I'm laid there, I can hear people going through my bag. I ended up, uh, I think, coming round where the paramedics sort me. I think because, because of where it had happened, because of the scenario it happened in, whereas I might usually perhaps have one and then be okay, I had multiple, even on the way to the ambulance, I just kept flopping on the floor. And the paramedic staff were like, I've just watched you do that. If it was epilepsy, then you'd go down like, like a lump of lead and you haven't, you've just, you've just let that happen. Uh, and then when I got into the ambulance, um, I was quite upset, uh, obviously because of what just happened and everyone had seen me, but also because I was very aware I was in an ambulance with two men who didn't believe a word I was saying. Um, and so I was crying and what have you. And the paramedic staff said, um, this is the reason I'm looking forward to retirement. This is the reason I'm looking forward to retirement. I think my main, one of my main worries throughout this is that people will perceive me to be an attention seeker, even though I feel like I have absolutely no control over when one happens, uh, it's happening, like I can't, I can't stop it. But, um, but I think half the battle is that um, worrying that people just think I'm just making it up. I have a scar on my arm. Um, this male nurse said to me, that's not a seizure scar. Do you self-harm? I said, pardon? Do you self-harm? I said, I'm not impressed with that. You know, and anyway, I kept going back into hospital and then I'm getting this pseudo, 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 which I didn't understand what it meant. So one day my husband came and I said, I've got pseudo, I've got an answer. And he looked at me and I looked at him and then we found out pseudo is like not real. When people have suggested, you know, you didn't, you didn't just fall to the floor there, you let yourself, that, let that happen. You walk away from the situation, you're like, did I let that happen? Like, is, am I, am I crazy? No. Never explained what it were because it weren't diagnosed till once I went in, thankfully, when this doctor were on the ward and she said to me, I'm going to send you to Sheffield. I think you might have this illness. I'm going to refer you to Professor Uber. And at that time, we had something else to look at and to hang on to until we actually saw Professor Uber, who in the first interview more or less said, I think this is what you've got, but just to double check, I want you to come in and be wired up and hopefully you'll have one while you're in here. But the hardest thing was at the same time he says, she's not in any danger when she has these seizures. If you could video it, it would be of great help. And the hardest thing I ever had to do through the whole process was watch Carol on the settee and take a video of her at that time. But I did it and I gave that to Professor Uber and that together with the seizure that she had on the ward gave him the positive diagnosis. went back to see Professor Luba and he says, you've got an EAD. And that was the first time anybody told me what I'd got. When you've been told, when you've been given a name for your illness, it's half the battle. It was that lady who I sat down and spoke to and it was literally, I was with her for 45 minutes. And within that session, I just gave her a brief description of what I'd 
what had happened over the last 10 years and she was like, this is without a doubt non-epileptic attack disorder. She was like, I can't understand why you haven't been explained this before. That doesn't mean anything. You've basically had a condition and put non in front, in front of it. So it just means nothing to me. It's like, it's everything I already know. Yeah, I'm having what seems like epileptic seizures, but they're not. Quite often when people, when I, when I say, oh, I've been off work because of this, or this has happened again, you know, and I know they don't mean it in a bad way, but people are like, oh, we really, we really need to get this sorted, don't you? And, <laughs> and then we'll get round to it. <laughs> Just like, oh, okay, yeah, I do. I still just don't think that any doctors have a clue what's going on with me. Doctors are so used to putting patients into boxes. You've got a broken leg, you've got chicken pox, you've got whatever. Uh, and if you don't fit into those boxes, doctors feel very, find it very hard to deal with patients. So because the illness initially was undiagnosed, it wasn't epilepsy but it was epilepsy. They were trying desperately to find a box to put Carol in. Then she got NAAD and so little was known about it then that they found it hard at a hospital like Halifax to put her in a box because they didn't know what it was. Now, if you live in Sheffield and Professor Ruber's your doctor, it's a different kettle of fish. It really is are uh, difficult to say since when people have been able to recognize um, that there are epileptic seizures and that there are seizures that look a bit like epilepsy but are not caused by abnormal electrical activity in the brain. There are discussions of this in the Hippocratic writings, so before Christ. And there's a lot of literature about hysterical seizures and epilepsy from the 19th century. Certainly the doctors who were diagnosing these conditions then felt that they could identify different types of seizures that uh, had some superficial similarities. until really relatively recently, we couldn't look inside the body from the outside with any great degree of success. So lots of symptoms that people produced, it was very, very difficult for people to tease them apart in various ways. As things advance, we get better and better and better at being able to sort of say, yes, you have this condition underpinned by these kind of um, abnormal anatomical or physiological features, so on and so forth. Um, so it leaves less space. Somebody's own subjective experience of their illness is more difficult to sustain in the face of that. If, if you feel something but you're being told, we have evidence that there is nothing there that underpins what you are feeling, that's really problematic. And that wouldn't have been a feature of the past because people wouldn't have been able to say that with any degree of certainty. They simply wouldn't have known what was underpinning the symptoms. The traditional um, approach to providing treatment uh, or diagnostic services for these patients has been that they have a neurological symptom, they go and see uh, their GP, they're referred to a neurologist, the neurologist um, says, uh, okay, this looks a bit like Parkinson's epilepsy, but actually it isn't, um, this is a functional problem, um, that makes it a psychiatric condition and uh, the neurologist would write back to the GP and say, refer this patient to a psychiatrist. My arm would literally burn, like as if, if you were to put your hand over the stove and leave it there. You know it's gonna burn you, but it's that pain, that intense burning pain. I was having that with just the slightest of movements. Movement issues, couldn't walk, talking, eating, 
lips are swallowing. Anything to do with muscle control, writing. But the uh, cognitive function, Cogfog was horrendous. Couldn't understand what people were saying. And could hear the words and understood the individual words, but couldn't understand what they meant together. If you don't have physical symptoms, symptoms caused by uh, abnormalities in your nerves, heart, etc. Whose role is it to try and alleviate those symptoms? If the doctor has been trained to treat and um, diagnose and treat physical symptoms and you don't have a physical disorder, is that the end of the doctor's role? And I think that's one of the things which happens in this cons these consultations which make things so difficult, almost the kind of pass the parcel of responsibility. The doctor's saying, well, I've done the tests and I've examined you and I can't find any explanation for these symptoms. You don't have a physical illness. Back to you. And the patient says, but I've still got these symptoms and your job is to help me with these symptoms. Back to you. Now I know <laughs> Life doesn't always go your way just hit rock bottom emotionally, completely hit rock bottom. I'd just gone completely depressed and suicidal. And one day my friend realised that I just wasn't really present or with it and she said to me, what's up? And she made me like go on a walk with her and uh, kind of broke down. I said, all that I've got in my head in between these moments of like, I don't know, these seizures, these episodes, is that I just can't do it anymore. I don't really want to be around. I don't, I don't feel connected to myself in any way. Nothing's really bringing me much joy. I'm so drained from the situation. It doesn't seem like it's ever, ever going to end. And I literally, I, I was just uncontrollably crying. I couldn't, because I felt this big release. Like everyone, I'd suddenly, I'd suddenly then just admitted something major that I'd been suppressing for a while. My brother and his wife had a shop and it was this time of year, January, they went away. Always had an exotic holiday, you know, Borneo, um, always went somewhere exotic, you know, and yeah, they'd gone to Thailand and uh, he'd been in this accident and were killed and robbed and his wife were injured and it was one Sunday afternoon and me and Graham were at home and we got a telephone call from his wife to say my brother were dead. Um, we were an almighty shock, of course, because we were the first to find out, and then 
told the rest of the family and then as far as it connected to my seizures, yeah, that, that when the shock actually hit me, I don't think it hit me till late on at night because it worked till 11 o'clock at night or something that he had a seizure, 10, 11 o'clock at night. And um, I think it hit it, it, it home to me then that he died, you know, uh, or I was in a bit of denial and we went to the hospital. They kept me in overnight and then I had a very rude, ignorant doctor come to me and who, who I'd met a lot of times with seizures, but um, I just said to my wife, he had another seizure, and I'd explained that my brother had been killed, and he was just very rude and said, never mind, you're going home after dinner. Anybody who's asked what Carol's got, I've explained it to them, like like a soldier who hears a, uh, a car backfire, and he'll drop down. Well, with Carol, it's some sort of memory, taste, smell, sound, or whatever, but instead of falling down from the gunshot, a brain just shuts down. And that's what starts the seizure off, and it takes however long it does before a brain re reboots, if you like, like a computer. And then she comes back to normal. And people understand that, but doctors don't. So... It's almost like a cup, and... You add a little bit more liquid each time until it overflows, and each time we something bad happened, then that cup would come up a bit more and more and more, and eventually it, f it filled over. All my life, I've tried to be quite a strong person, and and I carry a lot on my shoulders. You know, I I'm, I'm, I've lots of friends, and I'm, if they ring me up and they want me, I'm straight there for them. But Maybe I don't lean on other people enough. I, 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 I've got my husband, of course, but I, 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 I bottle things up. I, I tend to like be the martyr or the strong one amongst my friends and everything. You know, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay, you know, but probably deep inside I'm not. When I was first diagnosed with it, nobody would explain to me why it was happening or what I could do to try and help my condition. I was just kind of given a label and sent home almost a little bit. Sometimes I feel like there's only so much recuperating I can do, and it still happens. You know what I mean? So when people are like, oh, you go home and get some rest, I'm like, okay. But sometimes I don't really necessarily feel like that's, happen like that's helping. It's just, it'll... It'll stop when it feels like stopping. I don't. I, I still don't really feel like I have a great deal of con control over it. I feel very much like um, my my brain and my body are two very separate things. And sometimes my brain is like, right, let's do this, and my body's like, no. In 19th century, Hewling Jackson pointed out that epilepsy was teaching us a lot about how the brain works. I think dissociative seizures are telling us a lot about how the brain works too. Um, essentially what we are seeing is, in my view, um, a mechanism that kicks in when the brain reaches its capacity. It is, to me, um, in most cases, like a reflex. When you learn to walk, initially you fall over quite a lot. Initially you're not so good at maintaining your balance if you trip up. But then as you get older, you get better at that. And, um, and how does that work? Well, the nervous system automates the process of maintaining balance. There wouldn't be enough time for you to realize, hang on, I'm, I'm tripping up, I'm falling. It moves directly from the perception to action. That's a reflex. So to me, the of seizures are a reflex that kicks in when um, the kind of radar system that the brain operates to monitor your environment detects something that could represent a threat. And um, that triggers the dissociative state. And um, like a computer that's frozen, you have to reboot, and then you reboot and you come out of the, the state. The tricky thing is that each seizure kind of works because it moves you from this moment of distress to a different place where you come around from the seizure, you can't even recall what it was that was distressing. 
Um, maybe you're upset, maybe you're hurt, but you, you're not distressed. So each seizure has worked, and when things work, brain does it again and kind of reinforces the pattern. So the reflex gets stronger, if you like, or more automatic, more embedded. There is a, a big kind of body of research around psychogenic seizures, which includes a sort of like an epidemiology uh, describing who is more likely. So that the obvious thing is women, is that it is overwhelmingly women. Um, and I think that's an under-researched area, other than in, in a very descriptive kind of way. I, I think there hasn't been enough done to think about what being female, the experience of female gender, not biology, gender, um, has on these sorts of conditions and has had. Why is it women? Why is it so many women? Trauma is uh, in the background for almost all patients. Uh, around 90% of patients report some sort of traumatic history. Um, some of them report terribly traumatic history and, and would uh, uh, qualify for a complex post-traumatic stress disorder diagnosis. Um, there is this 10% who don't, who, who say that there has been nothing that uh, traumatized them. Um, I have two positions uh, on that. One, it is possible that there has been trauma and that it hasn't come to the surface yet. And I've had at least two patients who I was treating and denied any trauma. And one, maybe two years later, um, finally uh, came, came out with a, a traumatic memory that she had had, um, not with me pushing for it. Uh, it sort of came naturally that um, she finally felt that she could uh, trust me with this very awful thing that had happened. Um, the other theory is that uh, that ten percent may be um, just faced with so many uh, small or medium-sized adversities uh, that they uh, almost have like a stress fracture. Um, so it's not that they had a big trauma or uh, or chronic trauma, but that they um, may have had uh, multiple things happening, and they've been treading water and keeping their head afloat. And then, at some point, they couldn't anymore. I'd wake up in the middle of the night and I'd draw. I wasn't actively thinking about when I was drawing, I was just drawing. And I knew wholeheartedly it's exactly what had happened, because then looking at the drawing would bring back other memories, and it would bring back this and this. Everything just ran back to me. I was involved in quite a warped and abusive, I'd say, relationship in, in loose words. The way that I managed through it for that year was I completely dissociated from everything in the present time whenever a physical act was happening to me or a, whatever it could have been, I'd kind of leave my body, I'd leave the experience and then after it happened I'd shut it down and pretend it had never happened because otherwise I would have absolutely crumbled to nothing. And it just made me feel so weak, and that's what I didn't want to be. I think the start of all the seizures was through my mum dying and putting a complaint in, most definitely. It didn't start that year, it's because the complaint went on for five years which no need to have taken five years. This is the trouble with a complaint system. You drag it out and drag it out. You think, oh, I'm OK, I'm coping with all this, I'm coping with all this, and I suppose your body is running at 100 mile an hour and, and you think you can keep up with it, and all of a sudden, something's got to give. And that's what must have given. My brain must have just thought, whoa, I've had enough. No, and, and, and 
I had a seizure and then I had loads of seizures and they were having ten a day some days and going on for an hour and a half and and he's got to something's got to crack somewhere I suppose. You can't be a martyr forever, can you? But you you'd like to think you can, but you can't. I've done everything they've asked me to do. Like I've exercised, I've eaten well, you know, I've done meditation, everything that's possibly on this list because I so desperately didn't want to be poorly and was still poorly. So I think sometimes, like, I have found in the past I'd wish someone would just, would just give me a tablet or would just give me... If it was, like, I don't know, a broken leg or something, they'd fix your broken leg and then send you on your way. I wish there was something that somebody could help with because sometimes I'd try and do everything that they've told me to do and nothing, nothing changes. Playing music is like my me time. Um, and that th is just purely for myself, not for anything to do with work and doesn't feel at all pressured or stress related. So that has without a doubt helped this year. With Alice, I don't really fully understand it myself. I've never met anybody with anything even like vaguely similar. It's completely new to me. There's so many different elements to it. Mentally, that's that's the biggest one because I do think it's down to like stress, anxiety. You know when it's going to happen. Um, if she's had like a really, really difficult week, you know that you can tell it's building up. I just have to listen to her, see what she wants me to do. Do what I can, just stay with her. Just help her kind of ride it out. attention we can pay to what's going on around us is really quite limited. You know, we're a bit like a, a, a person with a tiny torch in a, in a big forest. You can shine the torch on the floor in, 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 in front of you, you can shine it on a tree, you can shine it on a different tree, but you can't light up the whole forest. So when you walk down a street and you're talking to someone and then a car goes past you, You'll probably be able to keep talking and just step out of the way of the car. You don't have to, to think, you, you don't even notice there's a car going past. I've got one friend who, um, she said to me one day, she was like, so is it down to stress? And I was like, I think so a bit. And she was just like, just don't get stressed. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I might be onto something. <laughs> I'll try that. <laughs> Most of us, the majority I would say, have the capacity to have things happening in our body that we can't reduce to a biological explanation. That's, that's a feature of being a human being. So if we can kind of get our heads around that, it gives us a bit of a window into some of the more powerful expressions like psychogenic seizures. It gives us a handle, it gives us a means, and it also gives a means of connecting that back to, if you like, normal humanity, that it isn't this side thing, it's a part of us. I think one of the key problems with dissociative seizures is, is it's a problem for the doctor and it's a problem for the patient because we don't understand it. We think that dissociative seizures are psychological, which means it's a disorder of mind. And my personal view um, um, is that there is no theory of mind. With me, I think a series of events happened in my life and at the time I just kind of blocked it out of my mind and 
completely blocked out of my memory, which I think is amazing that the, the man could do that. And then it seemed now it makes sense that then my body's response and backlash to that was to start cutting out at various different interludes in, in response to various different forms of stimulus because that's what I kind of trained it to do, block out time, block out chunks of time and block it out so I can't remember certain bits because I didn't want to or it felt safer if I didn't. I found it, it's been the easiest to speak to someone about it, someone that's got the same condition or similar. It's a two-way thing rather than you scrambling around in the dark trying to find an explanation. How do you find that people your age and your friends and people in school like, respond to it? I don't know, it's kind of a hard one because I kept myself quite separate from everyone because I'd been off school for months. Obviously, everyone knew something was wrong with me. You, you can kind of tell how, like, people feel about them by the way, like, they interact with you and how mm. they look at you. Like, I know some of my friends were absolutely terrified and they'd, like, completely freeze up and not know what to do at all. With me, I never really talk about how it makes me feel or what happens. We, I just kind of get on with it. But when you do talk about it, it's kind of nice. Yeah. And then when you get interrupted because it's decided, oh, I don't like this, and you start mm. having a seizure, it's kind of like, it's a bit of a pain. You talk so, like, beautifully and clearly about everything <laughs> that happened. Honestly, when I talk about it, it's like, so I feel like I've just stepped in some, like, honey and I'm trying to walk. <laughs> It's, it's all very abstract, so, um, yeah, very, very... It was really great to talk to you. Do not become a recluse. Do not stay in home and think, oh, I don't go out and win over seizure. Because you're letting it win, then. It is a real illness. There's... Lots of people with it. Do not be put off by people calling it pseudo. Stand your ground. Be brave, be strong. Don't let it beat you. Just think, well, I'm breathing. I'm still here. I like it. It's a shop full of memories. People come in and they just... They come to buy one thing, and they'll stop and look and end up getting loads. Of, and because the bags are all a pound each, oh, this will get quite a few, like... Yeah, but lemons, bonbons, oh, could go forever. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, you'll do it, you'll okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that is 1342 altogether. Thank you very much. Cheers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to have a get run over. Um, See you in a bit, lad. It used to be that bad before, but it's just all got a load of them in now. Oh, slipped. I told you to put your boots on. Yeah, very nice. This, is, I guess, is an article of faith rather than scientific fact, but my personal view is that the universe is inherently mysterious. Not only is it not understood, it cannot be fully understood by human beings. And I think the fascination but difficulty of non-epileptic attacks is that that's the territory that we find ourselves in. Um, and acknowledging that, the doctor acknowledging that, and the patient coming to understand the limitations of the doctor, that they don't maybe have the solution that they wanted. And indeed, the psychotherapist maybe doesn't have the solution that they wanted. But somehow, as we're all on our individual journeys, um, and the psychotherapy is part of that, um, I think accepting the uncertainty um, of this condition is, is essential to making progress with it. Just leave it. No, grab it back and put it back on again. Fine. I don't want any Style it out. You should have clips. I've got clips in. I have bricks in my coat pocket. Okay. Please, can okay. I just so. check at the end? We do do a health thing. Yes. Bye, Charlie. I was born this way. Yeah. Yeah. Right, the main thing is though, it's just lacking energy. What we had in rehearsal the last time we did this. <coughs> Currently, I teach in eight different schools. I take five choirs. So it is a chock a block timetable. But I do absolutely adore my job and I adore teaching. 
I think what makes me good at music and what makes me good creatively is that I find it easy to open up and give. I think that also is what the issue is on the other side of the coin with this. I think I do think they're all linked. In some ways, I feel a bit lucky that it happened when I was so young, you know, I've been able to fully rebuild myself and restart a life that actually is more meaningful for me with the people around me that I want to be around me. When I'm doing my art, I feel this sense of freedom and happiness. And in the weirdo, that's how I disconnect now, but by connecting. This whole process has really softened me, which was good. It's good. Often people say you don't want to be, you want to be hardened, but I think too many times in this world people try and harden you up, and that's what I'd done for too long, and it backfired on me. Softening means that you just give yourself that bit of space and kindness. Yeah, I've become a lot kinder to myself. I think. You're not trying to strengthen the body, you're trying to strengthen the connection from the mind to the body and then regain some of the movement that you've lost over the months, years that it's been going on. You know, in my case, probably eight years or more. Coming to both here and the Lishman showed me that there were structures that I'd got into, a framework of living that was actually dragging me down slowly. And until you understand what it is in your own life as an individual is, that's doing that, you can't change it and you can't stop the symptoms of FND. When you finish in a treatment centre and you go back to a life, whatever life that might be, you have to make changes in that life. You have to understand what part of that life was negatively impacting you. The treatment here is just the start. I know it's not going to be easy, but I know I can go through that now, whereas before it would have just collapsed like a house of cards. I came in with a wheelchair. I don't use it at all now. In society, I've struggled to to be able to be myself. So many different areas where they'll fight against you to, to pull, you, uh, pull you apart. But I'm grateful that I can still be a witness and a sunbeam to others. I had so many plans with my photography, photo shoots planned in Paris, designers, UK designers, so I was making strides to turn my life into a, a new direction. Um, and to see that not almost lost, it's, it's hard to manage, 
But at the same time, I have the hope that someday I'll get there. Oh,